Hello, welcome to episode 136 of the Chills of Will podcast. It's a pleasure today to be joined by Rachel Yoder and just a little bit about her. She's the author of Night Bitch, which is from Doubleday. It's her debut novel released in July of last year, 2021. It's also been optioned for film by Anna Perna Pictures with Amy Adams set to star. She's a graduate of the Iowa Nonfiction Writing Program and also holds an MFA in fiction from the University of Arizona. Her writing has been awarded with the Editor's Prize in Fiction by the Missouri Review and with notable distinctions in Best American Short Stories and Best American Non-Required Reading. She's also a founding editor of Draft, the Journal of Process. Rachel grew up in a Mennonite community in the Appalachian foothills of Eastern Ohio. She now lives in Iowa City with her husband and son. Thanks so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me, Pete. It's been a minute since I've been on a podcast, so I had to brush all the cobwebs off of my thoughts. <laughs> it won't be too hard, especially when talking about such a great book. We'll we'll talk about all the good stuff, but you know, with a focus on on Night Bitch, which has already been optioned for film. Amy Adams as I guess the titular character. Well, wow. yeah, right. Yeah, and then the movie, as I mean, knock on wood, is a is a go. It's set to um, start filming, start being produced this oh, fall. So um, hopefully, it all comes together and cameras start rolling. Yes. It's really surreal and exciting. Oh, no, I'm always I'm always one like maybe to my detriment, you, like as a teacher or something like that. Like I am not showing the film this book we're reading, or you know, like the book is always better than the movie, but. <laughs> And I know this book, you know, they'll be on equal terms. I mean, this will be such a good movie. I, there's so much visual. I can't wait to see what the actual like dog wolf like creature looks like. Yeah, same. You know? I mean, I think that was something I got to sort of write around in the book. You know, yeah. like if you're working in a non-visual um, medium, then you can sort of, you know, do some tricks where you don't exactly have to show it. But right. with film, it's going to be up there. What will it look like? I don't oh, know. Oh, man. How, uh, how closely do you think will you be involved with uh, like the screenplay and screenwriting or? Um, I haven't really been involved with that. The, the mm -hmm. director who's Marielle Heller wrote an amazing screenplay. I'm right. really excited about, I think it's gonna be an extraordinary movie. Um, <laughs> yeah, nothing but excitement. Yeah. Well, I'll be, uh, you know, trumpeting this book to the, to the heavens and same with the movie. So looking forward mm -hmm. to to share them both. Um, you know, so the last line of your bio is about growing up in a Mennonite community in the Appalachian. Appalachia, Appalachia. You can say it either way. I okay. still don't know which one is right. Okay. All right. <laughs> true in true literary form, right? Whatever you think it is. Yeah. Whatever it means to you. I'd love to know just about about growing up, um, about you know, your interest in language, whether that's languages. I, I wonder, was there like similar to the book, was there like a, a German strain? Was there, you know, other languages besides English? Um, you know, what were you reading? What were you into as, as a kid? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I did grow up around my aunts and uncles speaking Pennsylvania Dutch, uh -huh. um, which I never learned okay. and which I had. Um, and it's only a, it's only really a spoken language. It's not a written language. So it would be really difficult for me to learn it now. So yeah. Um, uh -huh. I grew up around that and I guess just given who my parents are, um, my dad grew up Amish, but then yeah. his whole family transitioned over and became Mennonite. Wow. And so my dad is, my dad loves learning things and he's somewhat of an intellectual. So he, you know, wound up going to college. He had a, bach a bachelor and, um, and a master's. My mom also went to college. And so they were kind of first generation college goers after, uh -huh. you know, these decades and generations of Amish families. Um, yeah, so so in our household, at least, we were really into reading and stories. And my dad's really into film, too. Mm -hmm. um, my mom was a librarian. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, when I was growing up. So story is really, we're kind of at the center of our sort of like, you know, the intellectual life of our family. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I remember some previous like Wikipedia rabbit hole searches. So like Pennsylvania, so Pennsylvania Dutch, but of German ancestry. So the Dutch is, it's not, they're not Dutch. 
Yeah, it's it's strange, right? It's okay. called Pennsylvania Dutch. Um, my family, a lot of Mennonite Anabaptist uh, people come from Switzerland. There are different okay. strains. So like my family is from Switzerland. There's Germanic. There's also like Russian um, Mennonites. Okay. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, and they all kind of speak these different dialects of German. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right, so for, how about for the next hour and a half? Can I just have you give a lecture on just the history of the minute? No, I'm just kidding. I mean, I wish I could. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know enough. That's a lot of, a lot of pressure to put on you, a lot of expectations. So, so what were you writing? I mean, did you, what were you reading? I should say, did you have any limits on what you could read? Was it like, there's the bookshelf, take whatever you want? I had no limits on what I could read, okay. which is sort of extraordinary. I mean, you know, my dad was, we lived at like the dead end of a dirt road in a Mennonite commune and we got the New Yorker and Harper's every week uh, in the mail. Um, okay. So those, I mean, and I read those from the time I was in like junior high, you know, um, it was kind of like these letters from an outside world right. coming yeah. in. I was like, oh, look at New York, like, look at all oh the ideas out there. But no, I mean, oddly enough, like no real limits. I, you know, when I was little, I loved Nancy Drew. Okay. Um, there was this series by John Benton who ran like a home for women in upstate New York where it, he was Christian, he was Christian. Mm -hmm. And the, every single book was the name of a woman, like Candy or Trish. Oh or Gina and you know they were like sex workers or drug addicts or single moms living on the streets and every story was this look at this woman she's really down and out John John Benton meets her he brings her to his home she finds Jesus I was very um interested in those I mean it was like more interested in kind of like the stories of the women before they met John Benton <laughs> Um, right. but I read like a lot of those weirdly mm -hmm. enough. Um, yeah. And then I also just spent a lot of time at the library because my mom was working there. And mm -hmm. so really it was just this childhood of pulling books off the shelf and saying, Hey, what's, you know, what's this book? So, so cool. So cool. Yeah. yeah. What a, what a great image of like that, literally like to the end of a dirt road and just like that portal to like New York and yeah, man. That talking about the John Benton books, this sounds so familiar. I got to, I'll search later on. I'm like, I feel like I remember, see, like when you talk about the single name, like, yes, where did, I, where did I see those? And just like an amazing image of the woman, uh -huh. too. Like, wow. I was just, so, I was just like, who are these women? They're uh -huh. so, I don't know them. Like, I've never seen women like this. Yeah. And so I think I was allowed to read them because they were like, Chris, you know, mm -hmm. ultimately about god's love and salvation but um i was just really interested in those women <laughs> seems like they were mainly about john benton <laughs> yeah that's that's true <laughs> they were john benton propaganda also <laughs> what do you think what do you think about john benton random lady yeah oh my gosh wow yeah okay um as you got older then into high school and in college were you you know where did the writing come in i mean were you writing from a young age was it one of those like hey if if I'm reading, I'm going to write my own. How did reading and writing play off each other? And, and kind yeah, of I mean, right, yeah, writing was just like an, a, a natural thing I just mm -hmm. did, but I never thought of it as something, um, it was always a hobby or just yeah. something that I like to do. I never, ever considered it something that I could actually do for a career that hmm. seemed, you know, like I didn't understand how that would work or how you would right. make money. And so... You know, I was an English major in college, but I never took any creative writing classes. Um, and it wasn't until I found myself in Arizona and kind of had like a, you know, like a crisis as some some people in their early 20s do. Right. Um, found myself in Arizona sort of lost and wound up taking um, a creative writing class at this little college where I was working. Because I did secretly want to be a writer, but it seemed, <laughs> you know, like it seemed a little indulgent and silly for me okay. to, mm. to do that. But once I took this class, I found it was a, this very kind teacher. Shout out to English teachers who yes. are the best. Yes. And she became my writing mentor. And she said, you're a writer and you should get, um, you should go to grad school. And this is how Whoa. you do it. And really like changed the course of my life. Oh, my gosh. 
I'm, I'm trying to think of like the timeline. I mean, obviously he would have come after, but was, was David Foster Wallace, was he a big, was he a professor at the University of Arizona or he went there himself for his MFA? He went there before I went there. Yeah. I think he's maybe, he was maybe 10 years older than me or something. Yeah, so he was kind of still, everyone was really talking about him, but I like uh, never met him. Or, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who were you introduced to in those days? I mean, who were, who were the, the writers who really just um, thrilled you? Inspired yeah, you? I mean, early on, as many as many um, young writers are, I loved Raymond Carver. Mm. You know, he made me think that I too could write stories because they were just, you know, they seemed so spare and so simple mm. and like I could do that too. Yeah. Um, so he was really formative. I mean, I read a lot of Amy Hempel, who I still okay. read today okay. and return to. And I really came to writing through short stories, like not through yes. novels. Yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess, who else? Like Lori Moore, uh -huh. um, uh. Hemingway to a certain extent. Right. Yeah, uh, those were the ones that, that I mean, those are all very different writers. So, um, oh, Pam Houston was a huge one because Pam okay. Houston was writing about being out West and being single and, uh -huh. you know, trying to figure out relationships and trying to figure out her body and its power in this, in this sort of Western terrain. So right. yeah, she was also really important at the beginning. Yeah, I've always, I mean, obviously respect for the books, but I've always felt like Hemingway, was, the short stories were the ones that I was drawn to. Yeah, same. You know, like Sun Also Rises, like, okay, cool, but like, give me a clean, well-lighted place or, you know, one of those. Um, one of the other writers you said reminded me of something. Oh, yeah, just on Twitter today, I saw this. there was like a little uh, thread going on about like which, like a short story that like changed the way you looked at writing and that type of thing. Is there... Are there any like the Lori Moores or Hempels or Pam Houston, the one stories that just like really stood out to you or Carver or whomever? Yeah, I mean, I think that I'm not gonna be able to remember the name of the Amy Hempel story now, right, but it's, a, spot, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. But it's a story where she gets in a wreck. Uh, the, the protagonist gets in a car wreck and she kind of writes the story of that and then goes back and she's like, but this is what really happened. And so it, it like turns into, you're like, is this autobiography or is this, uh, is this nonfiction? Is this fiction? What is she doing here? And it's kind of makes you, it's, it's kind of interrogating like what a story even is. Oh, man. Um, and, and like the parameters of a story, which I think she's sort of doing in all of her work to a certain extent. Uh -huh. But when I read that, I was kind of like, who is this woman? And is she a witch? <laughs> I'm like, what is she doing? Um, so yeah, that, that kind of blew my mind and made me see that it, it helped, it sent me on this journey where I was kind of like very interested in genre and very interested in interrogating um these sort of artificial boundaries okay that were given as writers yeah when you talk about like the parameters is that like having to do with like plot and sequence and narrative or like was it just does it so by the way it looks like it's called the harvest is that right the harvest that is what yeah. it's called yes I mean, yeah that, was it one of those that like it doesn't necessarily follow chronologically it's yeah it doesn't it doesn't, it doesn't stay inside a, a consistent imagined world. Okay. Like the narrator becomes r very real, almost to the point that mm. it's the author talking to you. I see. But, oh, the, okay. and so that, to me, that tension was really interesting when I first read that story. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. 2022 recent years like who are some of the writers i mean whether or not they write in the same genres or genre as you or same style who are some of the writers who really just you know you're excited when you see something new from them yeah i mean i will always read a new book from miriam taves who's mm -hmm. a canadian writer and also grew up mennonite um but even if she hadn't grown up mennonite i mean her books I are always, I mean, I've never, I, I don't typically cry during 
mm-hmm. what I'm reading and I cry during all of her books. Mm-hmm. Um, I love her writing. It's really funny. And uh, I will also always read an Otessa Moshvig book uh, for oh, better or for worse. <laughs> Though I don't know if I'm going to read the most current one. I'll, I'll have to take a look at it. Um, but I think she's just doing, making really interesting choices. And she is willing to be make frank choices and bold mm. choices that a lot of people don't like. Mm. Um, and that's interesting and exciting to me. Stylistic uh, choices or like subject matter choices? I think, I guess stylistic. I mean, I think it's also interesting that she kind of um, has been writing through different genres. So she kind of did like a mystery book and mm. um, now like her, her most current one is like a historic fiction. Okay. Um, but yeah, she, her books are, are also they have characters in them that maybe aren't the most um, appealing people, which is also interesting to me. Mm -hmm. As you got into, you talk about like the, the, you know, the graduate degrees for writing. Did you, I mean, did you do like the classic, like, you know, speaking of like Hemingway, I mean, did you go like fight in the civil war or did you, you know, to get like life experience, did you go sail away? Did you, like, did you have jobs that were related to writing right away? Or was it more of like the quote, life experience? Did I have jobs? I mean, I didn't have, I, it's, I wish I could have been like a cowgirl or something when I lived in <laughs> Tucson or in Arizona. Oh, but yeah. no, I was, you know, like a waitress and an administrative assistant. Um, so, I mean, I feel like I had so much to write about already by the time I was 21, just with um, all the Mennonite stuff and then the college stuff and then the coming to Arizona stuff. Um, Yeah, so I mean, I I don't really have any great um, stories of jobs worked. It It was a pretty normal like mixture of jobs you have in your 20s. (laughs) <laughs> as uh as, as part of your website you have a link to like inspiration and it's all kinds of art um do you i mean what do you think about the idea of like the muse do you have a lot of muses are you like you know listening to to beethoven when you're writing while looking at a some pottery you know like <laughs> what how do how does how does art like visual mm-hmm. art like stereotypical art in that way work with your writing I mean, kind of, that sounds like a great idea to listen to Beethoven while I look at some pottery and write. I have a, I have a sort of something that I developed during the pandemic, a sort of um, meditation that I do before. So I'll have, I have all these things sitting around me. Um, this, I write out here a lot. So for instance, I have these cards by Brian Eno. Okay. They're called oblique strategies. I have never used them yet, but you know, perhaps one day I'll pull one out and it, they have, they, what is, I'll find a good one for you. Um, they have these like kind of mystical, like you don't have to be ashamed of using your own ideas. And that's like supposed to be, you know, something you then meditate on while you're writing. I don't know. Um, so I'll ha- I have various kind of like process books uh-huh. and things like this out here. This is this book, Art and Fear. I will read a bit from before I start writing. Um, I'll read a bit from David Lynch's process book. Oh yeah. Um, so I sort of have like my, my gurus and my people mm. um, with me in books. Okay. And that, that is how I kind of get into the work because it can be just sort of scary to start writing and, and difficult to get into the work. Hmm. Um, so I kind of go and turn to how other people have get into the work first and then use that to get into it. Um, yeah, so that's, that's become my practice. Just like Hmm. finding people who are interested in their own process and then reading about that before I dive into my own. Whatever you're doing is working. So I'm, I'm taking notes. (laughs) I'm taking notes. So Brian Eno cards. Okay, cool. He's like, isn't he like the music, like synthesizer musician? Like he uh, is. Right? Yeah. I mean, and these, again, I haven't really figured out how to use them. Like here's one, you just pick this up and it's like, you are an engineer. 
Mm. And I could imagine like drawing that when I'm stuck and being like, okay, I'm an engine. If I'm an engineer, how do I go about writing this next scene? You know, just okay. helping to sort of reframe the work. Yeah. Especially in the crazy times, like around COVID and all that. Um, and just, you know, having a family and all kinds of things like that. Do you, are you like upset if you get outside that process, if, if one day of writing is different or is that just like, ah, eh, that's the way it is. I mean, that kind of just has to be the way it is. Like this yeah. summer has been really hard. I haven't been able to kind of find a cocoon to go into to write. Mm -hmm. And so it just hasn't really happened. And like, I guess that's just the way it is. And school starts in two weeks and right. maybe, you know, we'll get some writing done then. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about, about Night Bitch. I mean, um, what a, what a book, what a cover. <laughs> um, some raw meat, which we'll probably talk about in a minute, you know, just the hand holding the raw meat. Uh, you know, of course, I've got the copy here for those who might be watching. I'd love to know about the title um, and or, if, you know, maybe you could read that excerpt from the beginning. I don't know if which would come first for you if you wanted to read that. And maybe it's kind of self-explanatory, but just kind of, you know, with that, just like the kind of the genesis of the book and the idea of sure. like, the title yeah yeah i mean well the title came before anything the okay. title the title was the idea that then propelled uh, the whole okay. book um so i'll just read you a very very brief a few paragraphs from appreciate the that book. awesome okay when she had referred to herself as night bitch she meant it as a good-natured self-deprecating joke because that's the sort of lady she was a good sport able to poke fun at herself, definitely not uptight, not wound really tight, not so freakishly tight that she couldn't see the humor in a lighthearted, not meant as an insult situation. But in the days following this new naming, she found the patch of coarse black hair sprouting from the back of her neck and was like, what the fuck? I think I'm turning into a dog, she said to her husband when he arrived home after a week away for work. He laughed and she didn't. She had hoped he wouldn't laugh. She had hoped that week as she lay in bed, wondering if she was turning into a dog, that when she said those words to her husband, he would tip his head to one side and ask for clarification. She had hoped he would take her concerns seriously. But as soon as she said the word, she saw this was impossible. Seriously, she insisted, I have this weird hair on my neck. She lifted her normal hair to show him the black patch. He rubbed it with his fingers and said, yeah, you're definitely a dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, I mean, did this come from, a, where did the idea come from? Did it come from the, the tabloids? Did it come from a real life story? Did it come from- I mean, life? it came from a joke between me and my husband. Um, you know, like uh, I was I was going pretty feral at night. I think my son was probably three. I, I don't think I had had a full night of sleep in three years. And when- mother got woken at night she um was very upset and so you know one morning my husband's like yo last night man I'm like I know I know and I think I mean I think he may have been the one to utter the word night bitch first but um I was like interesting idea I mean we both laughed about it and then it's something we sort of volleyed back and forth and then one day I said, you know, what if I wrote a book where a mom did actually turn into a dog and he just started laughing. <laughs> um, and I'm like, it seems like a really bad idea. And he's like, yeah, Which, like we both love bad ideas. So okay. um, I'm like, that's a bad, that's so bad. It just yeah. might be interesting. And so it was like funny enough and provocative enough and yeah. um, like dumb enough that I just kind of started exploring it. Um, the there's that you talk about the feralness. I mean, I, I you know you hear people tell you, like, okay, you you know you're never gonna get a, a normal night of sleep in your life again, right? Or you never sleep the same again after you have kids, right? And yeah, there's you can't describe to a non-parent, right? You can't describe to a non-mother. I think that that tiredness that is just so bone you know just down to the bones right it really is I oh, mean I joke I joke that this is a book this is really a book about sleep deprivation but in um, many ways it is yes um Seriously. about that yeah 
So, I mean, you talk about how, you know, the the main character, the protagonist, she does literally turn into a dog. Literally, even, you know, even kind of leaving it in our are in the reader's hand sometimes about okay did she literally literally turn into a dog do you think she turns into a dog it was that I, your i do and when yeah. i first read the part where uh the, the husband comes home and there's the kid and the dog i was like okay that's obviously her but then the dog runs out and i'm like oh it's not her and then later i'm like that is her <laughs> um you know as as a hirsute person myself i'm like okay maybe i think she does if you if I didn't nail it down and you're not going to tell us I mean I don't know okay. I, I think in my mind I was like she doesn't turn into a dog this is just a literary book right and they're having a little fun right but you can't I mean who the one problem is who is that dog that's mm. in the living room exactly exactly who is and, it I don't know right and yeah. who was that woman at the dog park who was so far off and ran away true uh, was that one yes. anyway so uh, you talk about the, um, well, I think of Kafka and I think of Kafka because I saw the, the, the blur by the great, no less than the great Carmen Maria Machado writes on the cover, a feral unholy marriage of Tilly Olson and Kafka. Night bitch is an incredible feat. I love Tilly Olson. I love, I teach the, um, as I stand here ironing, right? Totally. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot. I, I, I have some, my issues with Kafka, I'm actually rereading it. I haven't read it in like 20 years. I think I'm missing it. To me, it seems like it's too much on the nose. You know, okay, he's like, you know, doesn't feel good about himself. He becomes a beetle, whatever. How much were you influenced? How much of like, like as far as this book is an allegory, mm. right? Like how much of it is like the literal, like, okay, this is what happens. This is an interesting story. Because what you do so well is you don't, you don't get like, or the narrator does not get like didactic and like, you know, this is why, this is how mothers need to be treated, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I just wonder about how much of like the, like I said, the allegory versus just like the literal, like this is happening came into play. How you, how you balance those two. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I think before anything becomes a metaphor or an allegory, it obviously just, ha it has to be a real mm. thing that makes the story go right. It, it has to be a story. And so I guess I didn't, worry too much about that as I was writing I was more I more thought okay this has to be a compelling story I didn't even really think like why is she a dog mm -hmm. I just you know like I didn't interrogate that I was like mm -hmm. she just is and mm -hmm. here we go because I do think that the unconscious has a way of giving you exactly what you need without you knowing mm -hmm. it and if you're willing to follow it into the chaos there are many surprises and gifts there and I think that was the process of this book right that right I didn't know why it was a dog I didn't know what these cr crazy moms and their MLM why they were there I didn't know what Wanda White's role was so you just that's the, you just write the, write the story and find mm -hmm. out um did Kafka even occur to me when I was writing this not really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I was thinking, I was thinking more Carmen Maria Machado. I was thinking uh, more urban myth and okay. werewolf and, you know, blending genres in that way. But I also have, I mean, I have not read the metamorphosis in its mm -hmm. entirety, but I've read a lot of Kafka shorts, mm -hmm. which I love. Um, they're magical and sort of, uh, unknowable. Right. Uh, yeah. And so I, that's sort of what I was writing out of. Like I was also reading a lot of Kelly Link at the time. Mm, okay. um, so I guess in terms of like allegory or what does it mean? Like, it's been really interesting to just see what other people right. make of it because I didn't think too much about it that, that going into it. Well, if, if you give me uh, some, some room on the blurb for the, you know, the reissue, I'm going to say, it's Kafka meets Tilly Olsen meets American Psycho. Oh, have you seen that movie? Yeah, I love it. Right? Feed yeah. me, feed, feed me a dog or whatever the ATM. Thing, <laughs> feed me, you know, I just thought like with just the blood and the just like, yeah, like when he goes and he takes his stuff to the laundry and he's just you know streaked in blood, covered in blood. You know, yeah. I don't know. There was some there, but yeah, and just the whole idea too of the, of that psychology. You know, at the very end of the movie, it's like did all of this happen? You know, he's talking to the lawyer or whatever, and the lawyers, you know, 
anyways um so there there is night bitch is not her, her given name is it it's not her baptismal name right i don't think so <laughs> so why why no name she is she is mother she is the mother as opposed to at times like the working mother is her friend <clears throat> Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I suppose in that way, it's sort of allegory, you know, I was sort of like, how about a fable? How about an allegory mm -hmm. um, where we don't give the characters names, but they simply exist in these sort of, as these sort of um, archetypes, uh, the okay. mother, the husband, the son, right? Um, and see what happens when we play around with that. I think at one point I considered giving them names and it felt too specific, too specific, yes. like yes. too real. I kind of wanted to be able to um, not be that close and detailed. I wanted to play it back a little bit more because you know how in myths, you don't get, it's not realism. You don't get like down mm -hmm. into the nitty gritty. You're always mm -hmm. in this sort of, at this sort of uh, remove from the yes. story. Yes. So you can kind of see how everything's playing out um, at a little bit more of a distance. Right.